Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, webinar from Bay Coding Club. Before we get started with the webinar with Alex Wei, I would like to introduce uh, um, some of the Bay Coding Club. So Bay Coding Club is a leading K-12 technology and mathematics academy at Bay uh, Area, California. And uh, we provide a cutting edge of computer science and uh, mathematics to K to 12, age from five to 15. And uh, we offer different kinds of computer um, classes, which you can log on our website at baycodingclub.com and to uh, trace. And uh, our team uh, includes senior technology and education experts. Uh, who maybe work at Google, Apple, Microsoft, uh, engineers, and some of the uh, professors from Stanford, MIT. And also we have some of the MIT computer science um, uh, students. So Alex Wei today will just present you the math. Um, he also came from MIT. Um, we teach uh, right now in English and we're in the future, we're going to provide the Chinese version of the class. Okay. All right, yeah, let's see. Okay, this is the roadmap that uh, we um, uh, established the Big Coding Club from 2015 at Upstate New York. Uh, which we set up as a nonprofit, and our original um, name is called Trufi.org. And we provide, yeah, at that time, we don't have the uh, mathematics courses. We only had the, uh, um, the computer science uh, online classes for K to 12. And as time goes on, we became some of the partners with the uh, universities and partners with uh, some of uh, the local school districts. And in 2009, we moved to California, Silicon Valley, and right now our name is Bay Coding Club. Um, and right now we provide uh, online classes and offline classes at, at the same time. And we provide offline onsite classes at Cupertino, California. Okay, this is a little bit about me. Myself is a 10 year old um, girl mom, and I, uh, I've been uh, working in information technology field for over 20 years. And I uh, successfully run two companies before one is software company, the other is public relations company. And uh, I've been a uh, community computer science teacher uh, at for um, okay so this is um uh part of our, our our teachers you can which you can see on our website also and uh, we have some of other uh, teachers that i mentioned including some of the big companies engineers and the university uh, professors are also our our um, teachers all right, um, this is some of the our, our classes that you also can trace on our website. Um, we have the uh, computer languages classes and also we have some competition based classes as uh, musical, ACSL, uh, math, a a AMC um, this year, AMC 8 this year. And we also provide some of uh, like um, computer science, uh, like uh, game designs and some of the uh, the camps like summer camp, winter camp, spring camps. All right. Um, our unique part is we provide the case um, to illustrate the uh, science and technology and uh, the uh, uh, hardware part, like embedded system, with those kind of case. Uh, so you can check on our website at baycodinglab.com. And the, this part, we use that uh, to present to, to kids um, the robotics or uh, some of the uh, smart homes uh, and the kids which you can buy from our um, online. So from our website like this, we provide you the kids, you can just um, buy it and do it by yourself. And you also can connect with the uh, computer and um, connect it uh, with the uh, computer languages such as Python and Java. 
So also this year we applied the AMC uh, host and our uh, AMC host code is 13581L. So which means if you wanted to do the AMC 8 uh, contest and then you can just uh, register from Bay Coding Club. All right, at the same time this year we um, attend ACSL also. We have a... Uh, elementary team and we also have a junior team. So Alex Wei is also our uh, ACSL coach at our junior team. I believe maybe later he can do some introductions. All right, this is a part of um, uh, our course on our website. You can choose it on our website at baycodinglab.com. And this is uh, some of our, our classes pictures which um, happened before the pandemic. So you can see we have uh, some of our uh, high school um, programs which will connect the, uh, with the uh, universities, which uh, you can attend our program and then uh, uh, you can learn some of uh, computer science or some of uh, cutting edge of knowledge with the uh, uh, university PhD students uh, um, and the professor. So contact with us if you have any interest in this kind of courses. So this is pretty much all for um, introduction for uh, Bay Coding Club. And I just want to give the time to Alex Wei to let him introduce himself more. Alex, you ready? Okay. Uh, let's see, the lighting here is not the best, but we shall endure. Uh, how do I sound? I think perfect. All right. So uh i uh what is there to introduce about myself uh i'm a first year student at mit probably going to be studying math with computer science uh i've done some competition math and some other things in the past uh also programming uh and i uh like to work and teach with both of these uh so i was taking a class i was taking a class called uh 18701 lately. Wow, this color is terrible. Let's not use this color. I don't like this color very much. But I was taking a class called 18701 for reference if you want to look it up in the course calendar later. And this is called like algebra. And it has a bunch of really weird things that you it, that if you hadn't seen it before, you might not really consider it math. It's math, sure, but it doesn't really have any like, it doesn't really have any numbers, calculations, it's more abstract. Uh, it's more abstracted. The actual numbers inside don't matter nearly as much as what you're doing to the things. And I thought that's pretty interesting, because up until like maybe what twelfth grade, you're just learning how to mess with numbers more. You're learning how to add numbers, then you learn how to multiply numbers, then you learn how to like uh, turn numbers into other numbers, like a plus b, a times b, a to the b log base a of b, and then there's some other complicated stuff, and then you like take the int, and then you take like the integral from a to b of like f of x dx, and this is what you learn for what maybe ten, maybe uh, twelve years, and then you're suddenly left without numbers. All you work with are objects, are things, and I think that's really cool, but I think we shouldn't really wait until maybe college to teach that stuff, right? I think we can teach some of this stuff now. I think some of this stuff, you don't need all of this fancy number shenanigan. So why should we wait on it? I think we can try some of it now. And uh, that'll be part of what we're talking about today. The other part will uh, just be some other problems that also do not involve uh, specific numbers. Basically, the entire present today, uh, the entire presentation today will include a minimal amount of numbers. Minimal numbers needed. All right, I have hopefully admitted someone. So the first thing, uh, first things first. What, uh, what really are numbers? To get rid of numbers, we first have to ask, like, what are numbers, right? Well, let's take a look at the number one. And let's say I have a circle. What does the number one represent in terms of this circle? It, it kind of just means we have one circle. When we say the number two, we mean like two circles, right? When we say the number three, we mean three circles and so on. 
But what do we mean when A equals B? We might say that it's like one equals one, but that's kind of a, this definition doesn't really, it doesn't really make a lot of sense when you try to reference it, you know? Like, I don't really like this definition. So instead, let's switch up the definition in, uh, instead. So we've been working with, we're working with circles, right? One indicates this number of circles. The, the numeral two indicates this number of circles. The numeral three indicates this number of circles and so on. So instead we'll say A equals B if A has a number of things and B has a number of things. And there is an equal number of things in the two piles. See, this lets us get rid of numbers. We don't need to know how many things are in A. We don't need to know how many things are in B. All we know that as long as for each thing in A, we can, uh, we can point it to exactly one thing in B, then we know these piles are equal, right? Uh, any questions so far? So right now we have this funny new definition for, equal uh, for equality. And turns out this has a really complicated word. Uh, this word is called isomorphism. Uh, for the purposes of this lesson, we do not need this word. This is just a funny word if you do want to look into it more later. But again, you take what, maybe 12, 13 years to get to this, just to learn that, wow, when two things are equal, they have an equal number of things inside them. Oh, fancy that. Well, really makes you think what I'm paying like 80,000 a year of tuition for, huh? So uh, now that we have our fancy word that we're not really going to use, uh, we, can, we can start looking at like what we can do with this. So in some, uh, in some uh, what were they? I believe in the 19th century, uh, there were uh, there were some indigenous people in on like West Africa, uh, whose establishments did not use any numerals beyond one, two, and three. So yeah, yeah, zero. Yeah, the concept of zero, uh, which is like uh, this number of things. Yeah, the numeral one, which was this number of things. Yeah, the numeral two, which was this number of things. Yeah, the numeral three, which was this number of things. And then after that, you just had a word that we translate to many, which is a lot of things. Now you'd think this would cause a problem, right? You would think that it's like, hey man, how many berries did you bring back from the hut today? Oh, I, brought, I brought back many berries. You would think that this isn't very con uh, productive or conducive, right? But they were actually using uh, bigger brain maths than we have all along. They have been using just this isomorphism, this matching method. They didn't need to know specifically how many items were in many, but if they say, if they say had, uh, if they say had like, uh, give me one second, let me switch the pen. If they picked like five red berries and if they picked four blueberries, then they see that the red many is greater than the blue many because red, you can match up each red berry with one blueberry and still have one red berry left over. So in this case, we can see that A is greater than B, even though we, even though they both kind of represent the idea of like many. It's a number we can't really enumerate, but it still represents many, right? Uh, everyone following along so far? Or have any other comments to say about like our definition of many or like why we're really doing this in the first place? I think that's, actually, that's probably a good question. Why are we doing this in the first place? I would hope that one of you has this question. Uh, okay, well, whatever. I'm going to be answering that question very soon. So I'm going to erase some of this stuff because I don't think we need it anymore. We are still working with minimal numbers needed, but let's ignore that for a bit. So I can leave this bit up, I think. I like this bit. So uh, first things first, let's take a look at like uh, some of the things we can do with the funny isomorphism word or just same number of things in each pile. So we can, or rather, I guess it's not really an isomorphism in this case. Isomorphism is slight, 
it's technically not completely that. It's technically slightly different. For this, for the purpose of, of this though, it's like completely the same. But uh, let's take a look at some of the things we can compare using our concept of like a lot. So how, uh, for instance, how many, uh, we can take a look at the number of, we can take a look at the number of uh, positive integers, which are like one, two, three, four, dot, 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 dot. And the number of even integers, two, four, six, eight, dot, 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 dot. Now this, uh, does anyone have any ideas on like which one, which one is bigger? Can we, uh, because here's the thing, these are both like infinity. It means like there, there's no end to the number of numbers in here. You can, if you have a biggest number, you can always add one to it or add two to it in the case of the evens. And you have a new biggest number. There is no end to these numbers. So it's like, it's like those power struggles on the playgrounds, you know? It's like, oh, my character is two times stronger than yours. Well, my character is a million times stronger than yours. Well, my character is infinity times stronger. And you start to realize, hey, 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 where am I supposed to go from here? What do you mean infinity times? Can I infinity times infinity? Is that how it works? Well, we're going to be figuring out how it works. So any first ideas on like which one of these is bigger than the other? Yeah, uh, the first one. Uh, why would the first one be? Can you? Uh, I'll give you like yeah. all the space over here. Can you draw out a way that shows the first one's bigger than the second one? They're both the same. Why are they both the same? Draw it out. And carry on forever. Wow. Uh, there should be permission for annotate tool, right? Yeah. Okay. If you okay. do not wish to annotate, you can uh, also describe it, and I'll, and I'll draw it out. Yeah, maybe like the first one bo uh, includes both odd and even numbers. So it's a bigger infinity, you see? OK, so we're saying that <laughs> since, we, since we have these, uh, since we have these, and this is like strictly, it, the second infinity is strictly inside of the first infinity it's smaller because the first infinity has all these extra elements that I'll draw in red. It has all these extra elements the second one doesn't have, right? And that would make uh, that would make it bigger. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. exactly. So someone else said these would be the same. Why would these be the same? Because both of them will go on forever. Both of them would go on forever. That's another interesting way to look uh, look at it. And that's actually one of the most important things to realize about infinity. Uh, this method of saying one is inside another uh, works as long as you have any finite set. So set being like just a bunch of things. So if we, ha if we have both, uh, both of these were not infinity, but a really large amount of numbers, then uh, our argument here, uh, our argument here in the box would totally work, but it gets really weird when we get to infinity, because per our definition of equality, uh, we can actually construct a matching like this. So match, match each. Uh, oops, we can match each number in the first set to two times that number. So one goes to two, two goes to four, three goes to six, and you can actually do a one-to-one -one matching. So by our definition of like two things are equal, then these are clearly equal in size, right? The main, uh, the main problem with this top argument is that like infinity is not really a number by this point. You can't really do numbery things on it, or at least you can't do most numbery things. But you can also do things you cannot do on normal numbers. So as a result, you can't really just say, oh, this one is inside the other, then it's clearly smaller. Uh, we can actually, in that case, we would be able to uh, maybe scale, we would maybe be able to divide each element of the second infinity by four, right? If we divide it, if it, we divide everything it by four, then it still has the same number of things, right? But then it becomes the new list, uh, one half and then one, three halves, 
and then two and so on. And then suddenly it's bigger than the first set. And that's not how it works since we established that the first set was just bigger than the second set. So uh, again, we want to only use this definition down here of equality, where if we can match each thing with another thing, then two things are equal. It's sort of like we're using the concept of many here. Infinity is basically our version of many. There's there you can't really add one to many. You can't really minus one to many. Uh, you can try. You can try, but those also lead to really interesting things. So that bring uh that brings us to like one of the common ways we use to illustrate the concept of like infinity, which is uh generally called Hilbert's hotel because the guy was called Hilbert. Uh, he did a bunch of work on it. He got upset at some of his work on it because it was mathematically scary because math eventually just becomes philosophy once you go high enough. But unfortunately, that is outside the scope of like one hour. But for instance, like let's say we had a hotel with infinite floors and the rooms were labeled like room one, room two, room three. And then for whatever inexplicable reason, every single room is filled. Ignoring the fact that that is a really blatant uh, violation of economic principles of supply and demand and doesn't really make sense in a metaphor, uh, metaphysical context. Suppose every single room is filled. There's a person in every single room and there is an infinite number of rooms. Let's say we try to add one. Let's say someone shows up at the door and goes like, oh, hey, uh, I'd really like a room. I'd like to spend the night. Well, you can't put them in room one, right? Room one has someone inside. You can't put them in room two. You can't, room two has someone inside. Right now, there's a matching between room one and person one, room two and person two, room three and person three, right? Uh, let me draw out some of these people because I like looking at human beings rendered as stick figures. So we've got all these little stick figures here. And then we've got this poor guy who wants a room. So if, uh, seeing that we have already completely broken all the rules about like economics that we know, then we can actually ask all the residents, hey, hey, uh, so we've got a little problem here. We've got one more person. So if you would move to the room that is one bigger than yours. So this person down here that used to be in room one now moves to room two. This person in room two now moves to room three. Room three moves to room four, which is not drawn here because I only wrote three numbers. If we move all these in, then this person can now move into room one, right? So infi infinity, you can just add one to it. it. It's the same thing. It's also infinity. It kind of just eats addition. Uh, by similar logic, you can also show if you just remove a person, have everyone move down a room. Maybe the person left from room 15, then keep the first 14 people intact, start moving from room 16. So like addition, subtraction. Similarly, you can also show multiplication and division do a uh, interesting things, but all of them keep infinity. So you might be saying like, well, what's the point of this infinity thing? Then it's just ev everything infinity does is just infinity. It's, it's not very interesting, right? Uh, that is actually not completely true because this gets even more weird. But does, uh, does everyone like follow along with the idea of like our hotel? And for uh, and like how we can just add or subtract things or even multiply up here. We actually did multiply up here and things just work out. Is everyone fine with this so far? Yes. All right. I will assume so. Whoops, let's not do that. Wow, this new drawing tablet is really convenient, huh? So Right, so now we've got this hotel operating and it's doing pretty well because it has been making infinite revenue. Uh, its expenses are also infinitely as large, but turns out when you just add or subtract infinity, it doesn't, it, things just, it, it kind of works out. So in general, it's been doing all right. But, but one day, uh, an infinite number, an infinite number of people show up, right? And these, pe and these people are labeled slightly differently than usual because we live in a world where everyone and that is now referred to by their serial number. Uh, I don't know what kind of weird dystopia this is, but 
everyone here has a serial number. But instead of the normal like one, two, three, four, and so on, uh, we've got uh, these people have different serial numbers because we we've seen we know how to put an infinite number of people in, right? We can like have everyone go to their room number times two and then put these people in like rooms one, three, five, seven, and so on. So that's not a problem. We're not scared of that. But currently, uh, these people are all labeled with infinitely long decimal points, like 0 0.12345 dot dot dot, or like 0 0.00000 dot dot dot, or just some random string like 0 0.572119 dot dot dot. So all, all of these people have different uh zero have different uh real decimal points. And uh we take a, one look at this and we think, yeah, we can fit these people in, right? Because infinity is infinity plus minus multiply divide anything is just infinity. All infinities are equal. Uh turns out they are not, which is a problem. So how can they be not? How can we show that we cannot fit these people into our room? It seems that uh, our argument from earlier that seemingly showed we couldn't fit it, uh, it didn't really work because we found a way to fit it. And by finding a way to fit it, they're the same, right? Well, how do we show that we cannot possibly find a way to fit it? Uh, this is where we use a very useful property called proof by contradiction. And uh, this is basically one of the greatest takeaways you get at college, if not before. So assume it's true, then something really stupid happens. But obviously something really stupid can't happen, so it must be false. Uh, it's also commonly used in like uh, arguments. So if you wanna one up your mom, you can say something like, well, proof by contradiction, assume that cleaning my room is a good idea. Then if it were a good idea, I would have done it. Therefore, uh, cleaning my room must not be a good idea. And that is the way to escape all your burdens and taxes for the rest of your life. Uh, for legal reasons, please don't, please don't actually skim your taxes. That sounds like a really bad idea. But let's, let's pretend that we can match up everyone with the room. In fact, let's pretend this hotel was completely empty. We took all these people and just shove them somewhere else, said, you guys can come back later. You're lower priority. We have these VIPs here we want to fit into these rooms. So let red be our room numbers. Oops, that's not how you count. See, I, I've been, I've slowly been working with less and less numbers. I'm starting to have trouble with numbers at all. Oh my God. So let's say we have these room numbers and we did find a way to put them in, right? Then number, uh, the first person has some like zero, some like 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, as we said. The second person has like 0 0.00000, da, da, da. Third person has that weird string we dealt with earlier. And so on and so forth. So let's say we did find a way to fit them all in, right? Then uh, let's take a look at one particular guess. And the thing is, we want to generate this guess. Uh, we want to generate this guess such that we know they cannot possibly be in a room. So we start with zero. We add a dot, and then we take a look at the first. We take a look at the first. Uh, the first thing after the decimal point. So over here, this guy is zero point one through three four five man, right? So let's add one to that. Zero point two. So. Since the first digit of this mysterious guest X uh, is not equal to the first digit of guest one, then X is clearly not guest one, right? Now you take the second digit of guest two, that's a zero, we add one. So the second digit of guest two, uh, guest X is one. Now guest two is clearly not equal to guest X since their second digit differs, right? And now you might start to see, oh, wait, wait, we, we might have a problem here. And we do have a problem here. We take the third digit, we add one, dot, dot, dot. So X is clearly not equal to guess one, guess two, guess three. And we can show that. Hello? 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 All right. Understandable, have a nice day. So we can show that for all these guests, X is not any single one of these. 
So we clearly didn't fit this guy in. This guy didn't get into the hotel. So we assumed that we could fit everyone inside the hotel. And we clearly have this someone who has not been fit into the hotel. What are you doing, management? So uh, these are actually two different sizes of infinities. And this is how, this is how you can get the ultimate laugh in uh, on, your on your fellow kids on the playground. So this set of infinities with like one, two, three, the positive integers, we usually call that Aleph, uh, Aleph null. Uh, how, do we, how do I write Aleph again? It's, it is a Hebrew letter I do not usually use. Let me just ignore when I pull it real quick. So we call this uh, Aleph zero. And then we call this thing over here, Aleph one. So if someone says, uh, I am infinity times stronger than you, then you can say like, I'm Aleph one infinity times stronger than you. And that is a bigger infinity than their infinity because usually when they say infinity, they mean Aleph zero unless otherwise specified. Now it turns out by similar arguments, you can even, uh, you can even find Alephs that are bigger than these and bigger and bigger. And it gets really weird when you try, you try taking like Aleph infinity but that gets really weird and I don't actually know what happens. All I know is that it, it's not pleasant. Don't try it. Uh, and don't order this many items on Amazon. Uh, so yeah, this is how you can uh, bully your fellow kids on the playground without, and you'll notice here, we barely did any actual math, right? We didn't need to multiply anything. We didn't need to, we barely needed to add anything. All we needed to do was just, things are equal. Things are not equal. Uh, Og C, og noni number. And so we wonder if like the one, two, three many system was really better than like our current system. Like I'm sure there are ways to get around the restrictions of many. I, it, it would be a lot easier to identify things by sight though. Most people can only look at a pile of maybe 10 or so things and tell you exactly how many things are inside immediately. With the new many system we propose, we can basically look at any pile and tell you how many things are in there uh, immediately. There's either one item, two items, three items, or many items. It's that easy. It makes checking out groceries so much nicer. Uh, yeah, that was extremely compacted. So does anyone have any questions so far? Because, wow, I rushed through that. So how does the X decimal thing prove that you can't fit anyone into the hotel because I'm not sure I followed. Okay, so proof by contradiction is we first assume we fit everyone in the hotel, right? So yeah, yeah. let's pretend for a second we managed to fit everyone with a decimal number uh, tag into the hotel. Then we generate, so, we generate the tag of some person. Let's call this person X. Now we compare the first digit of X's uh, decimal to the first digit of the first person's decimal, the person in the first room. So uh, these numbers aren't equal because as we can see, first digit is one uh, versus first digit is two. So X does not live in room one. So we take a look at room number two. Room number two, second digit is zero. Second digit of X is one. Unfortunate, X cannot live in two because then their tags would be equal, right? Uh, third room, uh, third digit is two, third digit is three. And like, for instance, if at any point we had a nine here, we would just turn that back into a zero. It's not really hard to deal with this problem. But for every single room, we can show X does not live in that room. So therefore X cannot be living in the hotel. We have not managed to fit X in. So basically we're saying if there exists a way to fit it, then there does not exist a way to fit it. So, and that's, that doesn't make sense. So clearly we have not, there is no way to fit it. Is that, uh, is that a bit better? Yeah, so you're gonna keep making an infinitely longer string that's never gonna equal anyone's number. Basically. Right, and so th yeah, this guy is stuck outside the hotel. This guy cannot be inside any of the rooms. Therefore, there are more people out here than you can fit into the hotel of Aleph Null Infinity. You cannot possibly match them together. Okay. Yeah, that was helpful. Thank you.
one wonders why we don't really teach this stuff sooner. Uh, that was also maybe what three four hours of content compressed into half an hour. So holy, that was. I was actually anticipating to spend maybe five more minutes on this. Uh, but yeah, uh, that was a really good question. Does anyone have any other questions on like any of the steps we used to get here? All right. Uh, if nothing else, I'm going to get rid of this and then just show several just small, in my opinion, small problems that I find interesting. Maybe you don't find them interesting. Uh, that would be very unfortunate. But I think they're pretty interesting. And the key part of all of this is uh, minimal number of numbers. All of, all of these problems hopefully involve like don't actually involve a lot of calculations because I really think calculations are the least interesting part of maths. They're like the grunt work, you know? As a true intellectual, I avoid the manipulations of the masses. I only dabble in the fine intellectual work, not the menial calculations as required of their children. Hopefully there were actually Hopefully there are actually children listening to this. This is actually, the ideal scenario is that like, I could have a 10 year old uh, in the audience and hopefully they could understand it because that was what we did for math club. But so here, here's a new problem. So we have a stick, uh, a meter stick. Or rather 100 centimeters, because I know that some people like me live in America and are completely unsuited to the metric system. That's okay. Nobody needs that system anyways. I'm sure most of the countries would agree. So then we, we have some ants. I'm not sure how many legs ants have. Uh, how many legs do ants have? I don't actually remember. The... Look, this is an ant. Just quit complaining. So we're, we're going to drop some number of ants onto the stick. Let's say, what's a good number of ants to drop onto a stick? Let's drop 25 of them because 100 over 25 is four. That's a pretty nice number. So let's say we drop 25 ants onto the stick and they're all scattered across the stick and they're all pointing one way or another. So maybe this ant is pointing to the right. This ant is pointing to the left. So all these ants are pointing one way or another, right? And then, once we sprinkle them all onto the stick, they all start walking and they all walk in uh, their particular direction. Now, when two ants bump into each other, the stick is only so wide, the ants can't exactly cross each other. So the moment two ants bump into each other, they just turn around and keep, uh, walking, keep walking the way they came. And when an ant reaches the edge, they fall off and, uh, I don't know where they go. You can use your imagination. I agree. I agree. I don't know what you're saying, but I agree. I am going to mute. Yeah, though. Okay. So the question is, uh, how long at the most, how long will it take for all these ants to fall off? Because I, I got to use this meter stick for something. I'm going to be making crafts after this. I bought it. I bought like a proper pair of scissors and everything yesterday. I want to make some paper crafts. But the thing is, these ants are getting on my way. So I'm going to go off and use the restroom or something. Uh, how many seconds should I wait? How, how long do I have in the restroom until I come back and I can see no matter what, all the ants are off the stick? Does anyone have any starting observations on like how we could probably do this? Surely it depends on how many are pointing one way and how many the other way. Uh, yeah, that's something to consider because if all the ants are pointing one direction, that seem it, it seems pretty obvious that all the ants will fall off after a hundred, uh, assuming ants are one centimeter a second. Sorry, I really should have specified this. If all the ants are pointing one way, then they don't really collide, right? There's, there's not really a problem. Then all the ants, no matter what, if we start an ant on the very left, it's going to move to the very right. So this is 100 seconds. But the probability of that happening is like 
uh, one over two to the twenty five. Uh, log log two uh, log ten base two is like zero point three one something. So twenty five times zero point three one is uh, it's like one over ten. It's like one over something like this. The probability all the answer pointing nicely is not very big. So what now? How do we deal with the general case? Well, if we can't deal with the general case, one thing that's really useful, no matter what level of math you're doing, unless you're doing computations, computations are stupid. I don't like computations. But no matter what level of math you're doing, if you're doing like some, uh, some like math competition for third graders, or you're trying to solve, I don't know, the Riemann equation and win a million dollars, no matter what, you always start from specific cases. And you try these specific cases, you try these small cases first, and you see, can we turn this into something in that works in general? So let's start with the case of one and. Can someone tell me how, how long it would take if we put just one ant somewhere? What, what's the longest it'll take this ant? Guys, guys, please, it, it's one ant. We don't know which way it's pointing, but like how, uh, how long before this guy falls off? I don't know how fast it is walking. Uh, sorry, ant walks at one centimeter a second. Uh, stick is a hundred centimeters long. So it's a hundred seconds. Right, so one ant, uh, it moves at a hundred second. Uh, it'll fall off after a hundred seconds, right? So that's a very useful conclusion because turns out that is most of all. Oh shoot, shoot, shoot! Let's not get rid of the entire presentation. That sounds like a bad idea. So it turns out having this one ant case is really useful because we can use it to find the two ants case. So let's pretend there aren't twenty five ants anymore. There are two ants. So there are a few possibilities for this, right? So if the, both the ants are pointing right, does it matter that there are two ants? Not really, because we they they just they just fall off. They don't really bump into each other. They're going at the same speed. They're all driving 60 miles an hour on the highway. They're not going to suddenly crash into each other unless one slams on the emergency brakes. And since these ants don't really have emergency brakes, they can't slam on them to begin with. Same thing, if the ants are both pointing to the left, uh, they're not going to crash into each other. They're not going to cause any differences. There's, it doesn't really do anything. So in both these cases, how long will it take? It'll also take 100 seconds, right? Because maybe we put one of the ands on the we ends and it'll just take 100 seconds for them to uh, reach one and two the other. So we're starting, we're starting to get a bit of a suspicion that the answer is kind of weird. But here, here's the interesting bit. What about when they're pointing inwards? They're both going to collide. How do we calculate how long these ants take? Or rather, is that the right question we should be asking ourselves in the first place? Remember, this is, this is a set of problems where we want a minimal number of numbers. Oh shoot, that's a bad circle. Let me circle that properly. We're trying to use a minimal number of numbers. Why are we trying to calculate a thing? No, we want to avoid calculations. So how do we avoid this calculation? Well, let's zoom in on this interaction here again. So uh, I'm actually going to pause the whiteboard and does everyone see my video now? Uh, I'm going to pin my video. Does everyone see my video now? You know, my brilliant face stuck inside this room that is quite literally a closet. Can everyone see me? Yeah. All right. Yeah, so, yeah. so we've got this, we've got these two little ants here, right? Uh, indicated by my fingers. Hopefully they're big enough on your webcam. And they're moving, they're going to be moving, they're moving, and the moment they collide, they turn around and they keep going. So, <clears throat> so let's think about it this way. Give each of these little ants a flag. So uh, the ant over here has a red flag, the ant over here has a blue flag. So red flag, blue flag, red flag, blue flag, red flag, blue flag. But when they bump into each other, they trade flags. So red flag now goes here and keeps going right. 
blue flag goes here and it keeps going left. So let's track the pro progress of red flag. Red flag, red, red flag is going to the right, to the right, to the right, to the right. It gets traded to the other guy, to the right, to the right, to the right. So red flag, as we can see, always moves right at one meter a second. Sorry, one centimeter a second. One meter a second is pretty fast considering it's an ant. Uh, but one centimeter, one centimeter a second. That means it does. When whenever a flag falls, there's an ant carrying it, right? So, uh, and similarly, whenever an ant falls, there's a flag that it's going to be carrying. We can draw a matching between the ants and the flag. Whoa, isomorphism. Whoo, that's a reference to our previous bit. But regardless, the the flag does not really switch direction. It just keeps going in one direction. So every flag will clearly fall after a hundred seconds, right? Lost all the pictures. What? I don't have any pictures at all. Oh, uh, let me resume whiteboard. Maybe, maybe it might be better for me to draw it out. So, uh, yeah, I, there's only so much I can do with my fingers. So we've got this little ant over here. We've got this little ant over here, and they're going, they're going. And this guy has a little red flag, and this guy has a little blue flag. So we can see red flags uh, moving to the left, blue flags moving to the right. So here's the moment right before they collide, captured with supersonic technology or whatever those kids are calling it nowadays. But when they collide, this guy is still moving to left, right, this guy's moving to left, then boom, these guys are suddenly going in opposite directions again. So the red flag gets traded to the right, uh, to the guy on the right. But since the guy on the right is still uh, is now moving backwards, the red flag is still moving to the right. So we can see that the red flag will just keep moving to the right no matter what. If there's another ant that bumps into them, the flag gets traded. It keeps going to the right. Similarly, consider the blue flag. It keeps going to the left. Uh, whoops, let's make it slightly less painful to look at. So the blue flag keeps moving to the left. Uh, it never stops moving to the left. If another ant bumps into the current ant with the blue flag, It'll also, it, to, for those who have collided, the other ant must have been moving this way. So now they're moving this way. And now they'll continue carrying the blue flag left. So no matter what, uh, as time goes on, the red flag always goes right. The blue flag always goes left. And so the flag will fall after 100 seconds. But since we have a matching between ants and flags, just that this matching might change over time, but there's also there's always one ant to one flag. So when every flag falls after a hundred seconds, every ant falls after a hundred seconds. So it doesn't really matter how many ants we sprinkle onto the board. No matter what, every ant will be off after a hundred seconds. Sounds like one of those commercials. We guarantee ants off. One hundred percent guarantee or satisfaction or your money back. Ants off after a hundred seconds with patented flag technology. Does anyone have any questions on like why we gave these uh why we gave these flags to the ants? How the flag work? It's sort of a roundabout way of proving things. Because I don't think I was really that clear. I was not that clear, was I? Oh, maybe I maybe I was either it that was or good. yeah, either that or uh, people are just getting bored and leaving, which is uh, probably slightly worse. But hopefully that's not the case. Now turns out this problem, uh, the more the more computational math you know, the harder it is for you to just do the problem. I gave this problem to like one of to one of my classmates here at MIT. They're like what the highly ranked competitive uh, competitive math maybe like what top 10 in the country in the grade and probably going to go off and do research and earn a bunch of prizes or going to like quantitative finance, become an octillionaire, right? I gave this problem to them. They spent maybe two hours trying to, uh, trying to bash this out by hand. They would represent the ants as like some sort of matrix, matrix with 20, like 25 by 25 matrix. And then, represent movement as a function as a function of like ones and negative ones and then try to calculate like just multiplying matrices using calculus and i don't even know what they were doing but it 
it's really not as nice as just giving each answer flag. So you might wonder like, well, why are we teaching all this computational stuff? Why can't we just teach kids to give flags? Uh, I think it's mainly about quantifying things. You can't really quantify the learning of like a kid based on whether they know or know not how to give an answer flag, right? Uh, rather unfortunate, but what can you do? Here's another problem. Uh, this was actually from my homework. So if you can do that, uh, if you can do this, hopefully there are some still some kids in the crowd. Uh, that's what I'm used to presenting to anyways. If you can do this problem, you are basically smarter than like one of like the top students at one of the top colleges uh, at math. So you can, I don't know, flex on your other friends if they really care about that. Uh, when, I, when I was a kid, I, I just wanted to go home and play games, honestly. Uh, but let's not worry about that. So uh, we'll, we'll give a kind of watered down definition of a group. So we talked about what sets are uh, very briefly. So sets, a bunch of things. Usually we mean numbers. So in this case, let's take the set like all, all integers. So 0, 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot negative one, neg uh, negative two, dot, dot, dot. This is an infinite set, but we could also take the finite set like zero through like 12. These are both sets. Uh, the curly brackets mean that they're in the set. And then we have an operation. Whoops. Uh, goes from, it just like takes two things from the set and gives us a new thing from the set. It's almost like it's the operation. Whoops, uh, I did not mean to press whatever I pressed. Hopefully the presentation is still intact. It just, I don't think there's that line supposed to be here actually, but it just means that like, oh, we take two numbers and we use the plus operator on them and we get another number. Wow, fancy that. It's almost like operators are something we've been using all this time. Uh, in this particular case, it's a binary operator, means it takes two things and spits out one. There are also unary operators, but those aren't really that interesting because it's usually like unary operator, take the negative of something. Wow, that's so cool. This operator is so complex and interesting to study. No, it isn't. It's really not. So let's say we have some set and some operation, and this is where we get things kind of abstract. So given a finite set, Or other, actually, let's let me define set a bit more. All sets have an identity, which means like, uh, let's let the identity be, be e, like e plus any equals the same thing. So like in addition, it's zero. Zero plus anything equals that thing. In multiplication, it's one. One times anything equals that thing. Is that clear? Like, right now I'm using the plus symbol for it, but Groups don't always have to have the plus symbol. I'm just using it because it looks nice. Uh, inverse. So uh, for anything, A plus uh, the inverse of A equals the identity, or the inverse of A plus A equals the identity. So it's basically just the thing's arch nemesis. These things cancel out. Identi uh, the identity for one under addition is negative one because one plus negative one equals zero. Identity for negative 10 is 10. Identity for 10 quadrillion is negative 10 quadrillion. For multiplication, it's like the identity of two is one half because two times one half is one, right? One half times two is one. Uh, finally, there's associativity, which we don't even need. If you, like, if you don't have a lot of time to really think about groups, just ignore this line. This line is not relevant to our current problem. So it just says A plus B plus C equals A plus B plus C. So you think this looks obvious, but in the context of groups, you can't actually take most of these things for granted because as we said, we're, we're abstracting things a lot. May because like maybe this, operation, maybe this operation is like, I don't know, mixing colors. If you, mix, if you mix the red paint and the green paint first, 
you get like some disgusting shade of like barf, and then you mix it with blue, and it's still a disgusting shade of barf. But if you mix red and uh, if you mix green and blue first, you get like a nice like uh, you get this nice tealish color. And then you mix it with red, and it becomes like a rosy tint. Uh, so yeah, addition in this context is not really associative, but for groups we require associativity. So now uh, we just say uh, whatever set we have has even number of things. Show there exi uh, show exists something. Uh, show there exists some x such that x plus x equals the identity, where x is not the identity. So uh, I had another legend. Uh, this guy is both a math and computer uh, legend. This guy is probably top five in the country for uh, competitive programming and programming in general. Taking some of the hardest courses for graduate students, they're a first year like me. Wow, this is not advancing my imposter syndrome. This guy spent like, what, maybe five hours on this problem. Uh, I want you to solve it in three minutes. Does anyone have any beginning ideas? So for instance, we can pretend our set is like uh, mod 11. So for now, let's, let's get rid of the infinite set because that's kind of distracting. Let me also get rid of the ants. Uh, we don't need them anymore. But uh, let's also get rid of 12 because technically it's not inside. So mod modular addition is just like clock addition. When you add past 12, you just go back to zero. So in this case, we have the element six plus six equals zero because six o'clock, six hours after six o'clock, it's 12, 12, which equals zero. So can we show if there's an even number of things in the set, there's always something that does this, no matter what our group looks like. How do we show this? Does anyone have any starting ideas? At the moment, I'm completely lost. Unfortunate. Uh, so turns out it just, uh, okay, so, Let's think about sets in maybe another way. Just what's another what's another nice set we can work with? Uh, maybe we can try like multiple. Uh, maybe we can try multiplication on nine. Is that nice? That's not that nice. But uh, what part are you lost on? Do you understand like vaguely what we mean by a set? Or rather, what parts of a definition of a set do you understand? I didn't understand at the bottom right-hand corner. OK. Uh, the bottom right is our problem. Uh, this is our problem. But uh, is there anything in like this definition that uh, we have trouble with? Okay, uh, so I'm going to assume we all know, we all like, we're all kind of okay with what a group kind of is. Uh, usually they explain groups over several days, but it's really just reiterating this stuff. Well, it turns out if you add the, the, add basically the idea of zero to anything, you get the same thing. And they take half an hour explaining this. I don't know why. Because it turns out you do, there must always be something like this, and it's important for the definition of a group, but you don't need that long to explain it. Similarly, inverse. There's always an inverse for every element. There's always exactly one inverse for every element, and they're inverses to each other. Well, every superhero has an archvillain. That's 10 second explanation. You can't have multiple archvillains for one superhero. That'd be kind of stupid. Actually, uh, let's ignore all the blatant counterexamples of that. Uh, just there's only one true arc villain, you know, and the arc villain of an arc villain is always the like superhero corresponding to them. And we don't even need to care about associativity. In fact, 
this this is distracting. This is technically something that we need, but it's distracting. Let me just cross it out. So our problem now is if there's an even number of things in the set, then show that there's something in the set that uh, that cancels itself out. There's something in this set like six that what that when added to six goes back to zero under clock addition. So this is a set with like 12 things inside. And 12 is even. We want to show that no as long as we have an even number of things, then there's something that is its own inverse. So uh, does that clear up like what the problem definition is? Does anyone have any questions on like what we're trying to ask here? Okay, I will assume not for the sake of like seeing that we're one minute over. Uh, well, let's take a look at let's take a look at like the elements inside. So this here is the identity, right? The identity is always its own inverse, like because the, it nothing else leads to the identity. Zero plus zero equals zero. Zero is its own. Zero is its own nemesis. There's nothing else that rivals zero because if it if there were something that were not zero that rivaled zero, then zero plus that thing is still that thing. But you can't go back to zero from there. That doesn't make sense. And then maybe we have some arc nemesis pairs that match each other. But since we have an even number of things, then all of this must have an odd number. Of, all of this must account for an odd number of the things in our set, right? Because each of these pairs has two uh, has two elements, two elements, two elements, two elements, and the identity is one element. So all of these guys represent an odd number of things in the set, right? So after we're done pairing all the superheroes and arc villains, we're left with we're always left with some odd element or more. There might be three, there might be five, but there is always at least one element left over that cannot be paired with anyone else in such a manner. So who's it paired with? It has to have an inverse. It's paired with itself. And this is the guy we're lo looking for. This is the guy that uh, when applied to itself equals, uh, equals itself. And we can see this for our group right here. So let me just uh, erase some of the unnecessary things. So zero goes to itself. Uh, we have one and 11. There are nemesis, there are nemesis of each other, right? You go one more hour from 11 o'clock, it's back to 12, which is zero. Two and 10, you go 10 hours from two o'clock, it's zero. Three and nine, four and eight. It's getting hard to read, but that's whatever. Five and seven. And then six here is the one left over. And there's always going to be one left over because otherwise this is an odd number of things. And we clearly said there was an even number of things. That's our assumption in the problem. So this is the problem that took, what, maybe five hours to think of. Like, man was up at 2 a.m. asking us, like, how, how, how do you get a hint on this? So my conclusion is that, like, there's a bunch of math or things we call math that aren't that don't really deal with calculations that don't really deal with all the boring stuff mundane things you learn in middle school high school or elementary wherever you are wherever you have been and whatever classes you ended up hating because the teacher gave you a b because you didn't show your work and hopefully this just shows like what uh this different side of math that barely requires any uh particular numbers or calculation it, it's more about just thinking about things in ways you're not supposed to think about them because you haven't been taught to think this way. And I think that is pretty interesting and pretty uh, probably not something you want to spend all your time on, but a lot of it is worth consideration, I feel. Like maybe you're just had a coffee break. You start thinking about like, oh, what happens if I apply this group to that group? Oh, I've accidentally invented set theory. Now to have an existential crisis because math cannot be complete. But that is a topic for an, maybe another webinar if I ever happen to do another one. But yeah, it turns out math 
if you think about it hard enough, you can never finish. There is always more math, and there are always more things you cannot prove with the information you know, which is it's kind of sad. But it also means there's always going to be more math for you to explore in the future, uh, once you have more assumptions. For instance, consider uh, the Euclidean, Euclidean geometry, which just means geometry, but it's flat. Uh, that gives you a bunch of nice results and all, but like the angles in a triangle are always 180. If we drop that assumption, then suddenly we have geometry on a ball. Maybe you're, maybe you're drawing like a soccer ball and suddenly you see that you can add a bunch of hexagons and uh, pentagons together. You get a ball and that gets really weird. And that's what happens when we add or uh, drop assumptions. And no matter what assumptions we have, we can just get more math. There's always more things to explore. So yeah, uh, that concludes everything I want to talk about for today. Uh, those were just some things in math I find interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Hey, um, hi, thank you, Alex. Um, so anyone has any questions, you can just um, unmute yourself and ask Alex we here or at the um, Clubhouse um, audience, you can raise uh, your hands up and then I will let you speak. Before Alex, we answer the um, questions of the audience here. Uh, we do have some uh, questions when we collect the registration form. So some of the parents has already asked some questions. Would you like to answer as well? Is it now, Alex? Uh, let's take a look. Yeah, sure. Yeah, one of the uh, the parents is ask. Uh, when, yeah, related about the competition, I believe. Yeah, when do you think a case uh, could attend AMC competition? So, um, yeah, I think this question is really simple, but um, I don't know what it's exactly they want to ask. It is because I, a AMC I, 8 or AMC 10, I don't know, but. I mean, AMC probably refers to starting at AMC 8. Uh, I think whenever they're ready or rather whenever they're ready and interested. Like, I think some of this stuff is pretty, I think some of this stuff is pretty cool. This stuff is way above AMC eight level. And we managed to still get over maybe most of it in an hour. I would maybe hopefully minimal trouble. There's probably someone out there who doesn't understand, but is pretending to, unfortunate. Okay. Uh, but uh, I know some people who have started AMC in like second grade those people are insane. Uh, some people started in middle, late middle school. Just whenever you find the interest, whenever you find the capacity to start. But if you force people to, if you force kids to just look at math and grind it all day, guess what? They're not going to be very eager to attend the competition. Like, wow, you leave them in the room for 45 minutes with a bunch of math problems. That's like leaving me in a room with like 45 minutes with like a plate of what, okra. I'm not going to eat that. You leave me in there, I'm not going to touch it. I'm just going to sit there and twiddle my thumbs until you let me out. Okay. All right. Uh, so for the AMC um, competition, so uh, so do you have an experience about uh, the AMC competition to tell was the case with the parents also? Uh, don't skip school to prepare for it. That's a really stupid idea. Mm -hmm. I know people do it. It's still a stupid idea. Don't skip school. Okay. Uh, don't bring way too much food. You are not only being a nuisance to others, you're also going to distract yourself because it turns out, well, when you give me a plate of okra and you also give me a bunch of sweets that you happen to pack along, guess which one I am going to be focusing on? I'm not going to be focused on the problems. That I'm going to be eating the crackers. Okay. Like, do not bring too much food and just uh, generally practice beforehand. Who would have thought practice practicing a competition to know how fast you should go and what you should be aiming for. Being realistic about yourself, it, it helps for doing problems. Okay, all right, yeah. For, for the case, for another question, that is um, one of the kids, the parents said, um, hey, um, my son is only fifth grade and uh, 
we want to prepare for AMC. So what should we get started? Which book do you recommend? Uh, Art of Problem Solving have some really good books. That's generally the default for anyone uh, looking to get into competition math. Uh, there are some uh, other series like Singapore, uh, Singapore Math or uh, online resources on websites like Art of Problem Solving that you can use. Uh, you can also choose to probably uh, take classes, though maybe if you're just starting with competition math, that might seem kind of weird. Uh, there's all sorts of options to uh, get started with competition math, I think. Okay, thank you. So there, there is uh, another uh, uh, question about related other than the AMC, they said, uh, so um, I don't really want my kids to, to attend the MC, of course. Yeah, I understand. And uh, they ask, so uh, this, uh, I still want, want him to learn better uh, math, but obviously I think that the parents down to the public schools math. So the parents ask, what do you recommend us to, uh, to take? Um, okay. so. Wait, so not doing competition math, but want to just generally be better at math and probably uh, look into it further, right? Yes. Is that what, okay. The question. Uh, in that case, I actually think a lot of the, a lot of the problems I was talking about today kind of veer on the edge of like recreational math. And a really good author for that is uh, Martin Gardner. Mm -hmm. Martin Gardner. Mm -hmm. Uh, he passed away a few years ago, uh, very unfortunate, but he left behind a huge number of books, which are just problems I find interesting and problems a lot of other people found interesting. And there are, what, 40, 50 years worth of these problems. And I basically spent just my childhood reading these problems, and that's what got me interested in math. Not really competitions. Competitions are nice and all, and definitely not school math, but mainly just these books. These books are really nice. Uh, you can start from there. There are some other authors you can also branch into for specific topics. But I really think recreational math is just a really nice place to start in that regard. Okay, thank you. So anyone has any questions you want to open your microphone and ask here? I have a question. So um, for different like classes and things, that happen on like a weekly basis, how can you contact um, them? Is there like an email or a phone number to contact to um, hey, coding lab? to um, enroll in these things? Uh, uh, do you mean like our classes? Yeah. Oh, uh, actually, uh, okay. Do, um, yeah, let me give you the um, information that I, you, you can fan from chat. Yeah, we can uh, probably put it in chat. Yeah, you can you can just um, shoot email by baycodingclub.com. Info at baycodingclub.com. Yeah, the information you can get there. And then we have uh, the phone that you can call. Okay, thank you. Okay, you, you got it. All right, thanks. And uh, right now we have um, mass competition um, training, uh, one of the class, and we also have the other one that the, um, uh, we have a program with the uh, another high school, uh, no, university, uh, mass department. And the mass department have uh, some of the, um, um, programs for um, middle schoolers and in case they can enroll to their higher um, uh, programmings uh, in the future and attend the uh, Harvard um, programs, uh, special programs. So if you're interested in that one, just yeah, shoot the email and uh, just uh, say it specifically. All right, thank you. Okay, other than that, Okay, other than that, any other questions here? Okay, if you don't have any question anymore, um, it doesn't matter. You can just shoot us email uh, whenever you have the question at info at bigfootingclub.com. And Alex, we also will teach ACSL if you also have the interest 
of his class and you can just do email too. All right, other than that, uh, do you have any takeaways for today, Alex Wei, and then we can uh, close today's webinar. Uh, do you mean, do I have anything to say otherwise? Yeah, the takeaways for case learning math. Uh, yeah, uh, do not use school math as a reference for what math is like, because that's kind of, you won't find it very interesting, both in terms of grading curves or actual learning. Uh, other than that, uh, just, I don't know, look around, explore. There are lots of, there are way too many branches of math. I like some of them, I despise some others. Like, uh, I am terrible at geometry, so I pretend it doesn't exist and I hate it. But I really like these uh, more abstract things where you barely work with numbers, you just work with concepts and then you use the concepts and turns out concepts do other concepts. It's basically like giving a BS presentation in front of your class, but you actually get points for it. And then somehow you won an award because you BS it so well. And you didn't even make a proper presentation. That's the kind of math I like. Okay. So, um, yeah, at the last minute, I know you've been a, a tanned or a, you have already achieved a lot of medals from mathematics. Do you have any? Any comments or last aside to the the case who attend the competition mice? Uh, nothing other than like uh, do not be discouraged just just because there is someone better. There are way too many good people here. Like I hang out on the daily with people who have won international gold medals. Like mm. wow, I feel terrible. But also consider these are only the people you see. You are already better than most of the people that aren't even participating, that aren't even trying. You are already way above the average. So like, do not give up just because there are these people. These people are there for you to be beat. That's good game design. If you can beat everyone in a week, that's not a very fun game, right? You want it to be challenging. You want to be spicy and you want to uh, really have something that gives you a sense of accomplishment. So uh, also don't be a jerk to them either. Uh, that also goes for people who are lower than uh, lower than you at like skill level or something. Just be nice to everyone and enjoy the process. And you will probably have the best time uh, that way. All right. Thank you, Alex. And I should say thank you all for today's um, presenting, uh, pr present here and to listen to our webinar. Uh, we also have uh, the webinar next week, the same time. If you would like, you can attend. That is the uh, about the robotics. So, uh, so I'm gonna end today's webinar. And uh, thanks again, Alex Wei. Thank, Thank you. Again. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Alex. Thank thanks. you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Bye.